In Romans chapter 7, uh, in, in the verses we're looking at today, 14 and following, Paul begins to talk about a conflict within mankind. It's a conflict, you might put it, uh, between two natures. It's a conflict that is inside of man. And what I would like to do is just to read this passage, and then we'll come back to it and, and uh, break it down and, and apply it to our own lives. But read with me, starting in Romans 7, verse 14. And as I read this, I want you to think about your own heart and your own mind, and if you have had similar feelings to what is portrayed here, have you had these struggles? Because I think it's something we can all very, very much relate to, and it's a very powerful uh, passage. Paul says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Can you relate to that? to that inner struggle, uh, to, to the fact that I want to do what's right, I want to do good, but I have this other thing pulling at me, within me. That's the struggle that Paul is portraying here, and we can ask a couple of questions of this text. First of all, how does this section in chapter 7, how does it relate to the rest of chapter 7 and to the rest of the book of Romans? Paul has been saying to us in verses 1 through 6 of chapter 7, which we looked at last week, that uh, if we're going to be pleasing to God, if we're going to be able to serve God the way that we want to serve God, there has to be a death to the law. And we died to the law when we were baptized into Jesus, so that, he says, we could be joined to another, so that we could be joined to Christ, so that we could bear fruit for God, and so that we could serve, he says in verse 6, in the newness of the Spirit, not in oldness of the letter. And so he goes on then to tell us, listen, the problem is not with the law. The law of God is righteous. The law of God is good. It's holy. But we're unable to keep it. The problem is with us and our weakness and our sinfulness. And Paul has been painting this picture all along, all throughout the book of Romans that we've been in for several weeks now, trying to show us that no one is justified by law-keeping. No one will ever be seen as right before God because you, you lived up to God's standards. You kept His law well enough. No one can do that. And so there has to be another way that we can stand just, justified, righteous before God. And what we see in this section today the law can't justify and the law cannot sanctify us. The law cannot 
make us walk in holiness because there's this inner conflict and inner turmoil that goes on within each one of us. One very important question that we have to answer or try to answer as we get into this section is, who is this man? Who is this wretched man that Paul is talking about? Uh, Paul is talking in the first person. He uses the word I, but it seems to me that he's painting a picture of not just himself, but of all mankind. And it seems that what Paul is, is, is struggling with is not sin as a Christian. We're not talking about someone here who is who is in Christ and is having struggles with sin, although we all do have struggles with sin, don't we? But I want you to notice the wording that he uses. And, and this is a really hotly debated thing here. Is Paul talking about being a Christian and struggling with sin? Or is Paul talking about someone who's not in Christ and who is living under the law? Well, uh, look at verse 14 again with me. Who is this man? He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh sold into bondage to sin. Now, does that sound like someone who is in Christ based upon what Paul has been saying all through chapter 6? That when you come into Christ, when you're baptized into Jesus, you're set free from the power of sin. Sin is no longer your master. And so here he's talking about someone in verse 14 who is sold into bondage to sin. This is not, I don't believe, someone who is in Christ. Look down at, uh, at verse 23. At the end of that verse, Paul says that uh, the law of, of, uh, of sin is making him a prisoner. He's a prisoner of the law of sin. Does that sound like Someone in Christ Jesus who has been set free from sin, who has died to sin, who is no longer a slave to sin. And so I believe we're talking about someone here. They're, they're not a Christian. They're not in Christ. The, the slavery to sin has not been broken. But it's someone who is a God-fearing person, isn't it? Did you notice as we read through this, this is not a decadent uh, just depraved person who's going after all kinds of sin in his life. What kind of person is this? He says, I want to do what's right. I want to do what's good. I, I want to follow God. But I keep being defeated over and over again in my, in my desire to follow God, to serve God. So no, this is not a, a decadent, uh, depraved you know, person living the heathen lifestyle. This is a God-fearing person I believe it's a person who's not in Christ and who's under the law. Having said that, I think it certainly we can relate to it, especially if we're in Christ and we're still trying to live under the law. We're still approaching God from a standpoint of law and a system of law in order to be pleasing to God. And so having... Having discussed who this person is, what we're going to see as we go along is this is a person, God-fearing, wants to do right, but they're conflicted. They're of two wills, they're of two laws, and they are of two cries. And that's what we're going to see as we go through these verses. First of all, let's look at the fact that this person is of two wills. Look at verse 14 and 15 again with me. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate. Can you sense the frustration? I'm just so frustrated. I'm so defeated because... I want to do what is right. And what I'm doing, I don't understand. I don't understand why I do the things that I do. I, I, I'm not practicing the things that I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing that I hate. We probably could all look into our lives and see at least a time in our lives when we felt that way. And it happens all the time to people that we get... Uh, 
you know, tempted and pulled by the, by the things of this world and of this life. People fall into things like pornography and they say, I don't want to be doing this. I hate what I'm doing. I see that it's destroying my relationships and I hate it and I want to do what's right and yet I keep getting pulled back into that. Or, or just sexual relations outside of marriage. I know that that's not right. I don't want to do that and, and I hate that I do this. But I keep getting pulled back into it and I don't understand what's happening to me. Or substance abuse. I hate this. It's destroying me. And I want to change, but I can't seem to change. Sins of the tongue. I, I see that I'm, I'm destroying relationships with the things that I say, with my outburst of anger or with my gossip or whatever it is. And I hate it. And I don't understand it. And I want to do right, but I can't seem to do right. Can you relate to these things? In, in verses 18 and 19, look with me there. He says much the same thing again. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. I want to, but I'm not doing what I want to do. He says in verse 19, For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. And his conclusion in all of this, look, look at verse 17. He says, So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Look at verse 20. What is his conclusion to all of this? But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. He comes to the conclusion that there is something dwelling within me that is very powerful, and that thing is sin. It is dwelling within me, and I don't like it, but that's just, the, that's just how it is. I'm defeated by sin. And, and notice in these, in these verses, in 18 and 19, uh, or 17 rather, in 20 and 21, he's not making excuses for himself. He's not saying, well, it's okay, that's just sin dwelling in me. And I want, to do, I want to do right, so it's okay. It's not that at all. He, he's just recognizing, I have a big problem here, and the problem is with sin. And so how can I, how can I break free from this? This person is not only of two wills, but he feels the pull between two laws or principles that are at work within him. Look at verse 22. What is his attitude in his mind? He says, For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. I love the law of God. I joyfully agree with the law of God. What God has said and how God wants me to live, it's right, and I know that. So he agrees with the law of God, and yet, look at verse 23. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind. See, the law of his mind here is, is that I agree with the law of God. I love the law of God. I know it's right. But there's this other law, this other principle that is waging war against my mind. And isn't that what it feels like when you're struggling with sin? There is a war going on within you. These spiritual uh, things that you, that you want are waging war against the fleshly side of our nature. And you can just feel it inside of you. So there are two laws at work. There's the law of God, the law that's in his mind, the law that he wants to follow. And then there's this different law in 23. Read on with me there. Uh, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Here's this other law. It's the law of sin. 
Well, what is the law of sin? It's everything that he's just been describing. I want to do right, but I can't seem to do right. Sin has taken over within me. It's the law of sin. Just when I I think I'm doing well, just when I think I'm obeying God and everything's going well, the law of sin rears its ugly head. And it pulls me away from God, and sin takes opportunity through the commandments of God, and it kills me. That's what he said back in verse 11. The law of sin within my body, I, I feel like and I know that I'm an utter failure despite my best efforts. I find myself to be condemned because I know that despite what I want, I cannot live up to the law of God, to God's holy standard. And because of all of this, his two wills and these two laws that are fighting within his his inner being, there are two cries that come out of his heart. Two cries. Look at verse 24. Here's the first cry. Wretched man that I am. Oh God, I'm so wretched. I, I'm tired of this fight. I, I'm miserable. I'm imprisoned. And this is, this is a cry for rescue from a drowning man, isn't it? I'm so wretched. He says, who will set me free from the body of this death? And that is the question for mankind. Who Who will set us free? How will we be set free? Because we all face this struggle. But then there's another cry. Look at verse uh, 25. What's the other cry? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, God. He's starting to see the light. I am wretched. I need rescue. But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Because he's starting to see that's where the answer lies. That's how I can be set free. That's how I can overcome sin. It's going to be through Jesus Christ. And because of Christ, as we've talked about all along, I can now serve God acceptably. I can now be pleasing to God, even though I know that I don't fulfill all of his demands perfectly. Right? We don't fulfill God's demands perfectly, do we? But because of Jesus Christ, because he has set us free from the law, we can now serve God acceptably and be right with God and be accepted by God, even though we're not perfect. We're striving to be, but we fall short. But there's this great comfort in that, that thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So on the one hand, he says, I myself with my mind, I'm serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. He's not saying, oh, I'm going to go ahead and live in my flesh, as long as my mind's in the right place. No, he's saying, I realize because of Jesus Christ, I don't have to be flawless in my keeping of the law, and God will accept me because of Jesus Christ. And so we begin to start to see the answer to this dilemma that is in mankind the, the two slaveries that are in mankind. I, I want to be a slave to God, but I find myself a slave to sin. What is the answer to this? What is the answer in your life and in my life as we struggle with sin? Part of the answer we saw earlier in chapter 7. Part of the answer is that there must be a death to the law. And when you and I were baptized into Christ Jesus, we came to him in faith. We put on Christ in baptism. Did you know that you died to the law? And because you died to the law, he says, now you can be joined to Christ. Now you can bear fruit for God. Now you can serve God in newness of the Spirit. But part of the answer to this also lies in chapter 8. And you're just going to have to wait until next week to see that in full. We just don't have time to get into chapter 8. But I want you to read ahead. I want you to look at chapter 8. And let me tell you, just I hate to spoil the plot, but let me tell you what he says there in those verses. There is another law called the law of the spirit of life. And the law of the spirit of life 
he says in 8.2, is what will set you free from the law of sin and death. It's the Spirit's law. It's the Spirit who comes to dwell in us when we come into Christ. It's, it's the law that can set you free, finally, from this struggle. And if we rely on the Spirit's power, see, that's the key. When we live in the flesh, we're not necessarily just talking about uh, our sinful nature, but we're talking about, I'm trying to do this all on my own. I'm trying to overcome sin by my power. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buckle down. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps, and I'm going to finally do what's right. And where does that leave us? We fail and we fail and we fail again. But what if we could draw off of the Spirit's power, the Spirit of God who dwells in the inner man? It's the Spirit of God who can help us to finally break free and to overcome sin in our lives. That's the key. Stop relying on your own strength. Be open to God. Follow the Spirit Lead where the Spirit uh, leads you through, through the Word of God, but rely on Jesus. This is the key. You're not relying on a legal code. You're relying on Jesus and on His Spirit in the inner man. Not your own strength. Not your own might. And as we do this, we'll begin to break free. Finally. Finally begin to break free and to live in the way that our mind says, that's how I want to live. But it's by God's power. It's by the Spirit's power. It took me a long time to understand that and to learn that and to really get that in my heart. That's the key. The Spirit's power, the Spirit's help. And that's what he gets into in chapter 8. But if you would just ask God, are you struggling with sin? We all struggle with sin. Are you struggling mightily with sin in your life? Would you ask God to help you to rely on His Spirit? Ask God to help you to overcome by His power? Ask God to change your heart and to change your desires in the inner man? That's what the Spirit of God does. And we'll find that we're beginning to break free. We're beginning to live for the Lord. We're beginning to, to be holy in His sight by His strength and His power. So if you're struggling this morning, but you want to do right, this is the only way to overcome, to be united with Christ and to receive His Spirit into your heart. Have you done that? Have you been united with Jesus? Have you put your faith into Him and been buried with Him in baptism and raised up with Him that's the moment you die to the law, and that's the moment that the Spirit of God comes to dwell in your heart. And are you struggling with sin this morning, but you're in Christ? We would love to pray with you if you need the prayers of the congregation for strength to overcome. If there's anything you need this morning, let it be known while we stand and sing.